Uh, okay, so um, this can happen, and the big application is what's called Fourier series, where we actually have a, it's, it's similar to this, but there can be an infinite number of terms, and we can't live without Fourier series. Some of you are aware of this, but if you're not, you will be eventually in this acoustic sequence. We use Fourier analysis all the time, you know, and I'll, 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 we'll discuss it. We're going to start talking about it today. So there are two, for this particular case of two frequencies, this is where we're starting, there are two cases when the frequencies are equal and when they're not equal. And we're going to look at when they're, we started to look at this yesterday, when they're, when they're equal. Um, and I didn't, we had enough, I postponed this demo. I'd like to show you this straight away now here. There's this amazing demonstration here. And um, it sat in the demo room for years and nobody understood it or cared to understand it, including me. And then finally, one year, I think in the 2000s, I made a connection between this course and this. And this is an ingenious device. Anyone ever seen this before? Okay, so you'll see here we have a sinusoid, all right? And the reason it's a sinusoid, there are these beads here, and there are these plastic, they're falling apart, these plastic tubes here. And they have different heights, and such that in most cases, th these beads fall on a sinusoid. See, there's, it's, this is old and it's falling apart, okay? But you see the sinusoid here, okay? So it looks kind of boring, right? But, but watch this. This can be pushed up, right? So here's the idea. This is a sinusoid. Oh, you can think of, think of this as a frequent, you can think of this as time. It has a definite frequency, sinusoidal frequency. Now, because it's in space, we, we use the word wavelength. This has a certain wavelength, okay? But it's the same idea here, time and space. Um, you'll notice that this is a sinusoid with the same amplitude, right, and same frequency or wavelength. So when I push this in here, and I have to, it's hard to do this now because this thing is, you can see that we're, we're going to lift these by this amount. We're adding two sinusoids of the same frequency or wavelength, right? That's what we're doing here. What you're seeing here is the addition of the two. Okay, and as we go along here, you can see what is the result? The result is the red here when we add them two together. And what do you see? It's always a sinusoid. Ah. It's, <laughs> it's, it's always a sinusoid of the same frequency, right? Uh, the problem is this thing is flopping out. These things can fall back. This is trouble, okay? <laughs> now, it depends on what you get. depends upon phase. What happens when I have two sinusoids of the same frequency and they're 180 degrees out of phase? Not and you can see the 180 degrees here, right? This one is a max. This is a min, so they're at, we're getting destructive interference, right? Yeah. It's, oh, see there it's starting to, okay. See how this is now behind that? That's the problem. <laughs> that's, one, that's one of the problems here. Okay. And we'll do this later. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> okay. Okay, but anyway, this is actually a mechanical demonstration that when you add two sinusoids of the same frequency, you get a, another sinusoid of the same frequency. It's nice. Um, now, we started to do this, and I, 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 understood, I understand there's some confusion here. This uh, vector here is, oh, I guess we can uh, turn off, uh, Josh, can you turn off the light? Sorry. Yeah, it's better with the lights off, right, for the video. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> so here's one of our amplitudes. We're adding these two together. It's going around at a certain frequency. This one's going around at the same frequency. Instead of adding them like this, which I think that's where the confusion is, take this A2 and put its tail at the origin here. So now we have one vector here, or phaser, however you want to look at it. One vector here. They're both going around together at the same rate, right? So I've got one vector here, one vector here. Their sum is along here, this parallelogram right here. There's some, and it has to go, they, they, they all rigidly move around. Okay, maybe that doesn't work either. <laughs> but anyway, however you want to look at it, this way or the way I just, I thought that would, I'd see some recognition here. But anyway, um, 
when they both have the same frequency, there, or there's going to be a constant amplitude moving at this. At, they're all going to, these vectors are all going to move together, however you want to look at it. You can move it down here. This one's just going to move around with all and have a constant amplitude, and it'll be going at the same frequency. So to calculate it, here and here it is, we know this A has to be going at the same frequency and it'll have some amplitude, some complex amplitude. We don't know the magnitude here and we don't know the phase. That's what we want to determine. Now there are two ways you can do this. There's a geometrical way. That's what I have here. Um, the other way I'll talk about in a minute when we get to the next slide here, or one after that, I can't remember. You can see this is see this right triangle right here? I know that the square of this is going to be the square of the real part plus the square of the imaginary part. This Pythagoras. Right? So that's what I've done here. The real part is the sum of the real part of this complex amplitude and the real part of that. I sum them, I square them, and then I do the similar thing over here, sum of them squared, and then I simplify this. And what you end up with is this. And this is equivalent to the law of cosines. How many of you remember the law of, co or had the law of cosines? Do they teach this anymore? Okay, <laughs> good. What it is is a generalization of Pythagoras. You know, Pythagoras tells us that for a right triangle, the square of this is the sum of the squares, right? What if it's not a right triangle? Well, you've got to go to the law of cosines. And this is equivalent. It's not precise, it's equivalent, okay? It's not exactly the same. But because we have these, because of our definition of the angles here. But this is the law of cosines. So we could have derived this. If we use the law of cosines, we could have skipped, we could have gone directly to there. Um, okay, well, that's the amplitude. What about the phase? Oh, well, the phase, I, it's a t the tangent of phi is the imaginary part divided by the real part. So I add these two imaginary parts. Here we are. Where is it? Here it is. And I divide by the sum of the real parts, so that's the tangent. All right, and now we've uh, we're done. We've got the uh, solution. We've now determined the a, the amplitude, and the phase in terms of these individual amplitudes and individual phases. And you can add three or more, right? It's clear. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay, so now we're going to do the case where they're, where they're unequal. Now we can still look, use this. And again, you may want to imagine this to be over here, parallel transported down to here, the A2. Now they're going around at different rates. Can this, can this be going in simple harmonic motion? A constant rate and a constant, no way. It's not going to happen. We've got two frequencies in the problem here. So it's more complicated and more interesting, too. Um, uh, let me do this next, okay? Uh, there's a question. Does the motion repeat? We did this in mechanics, remember? Everyone, students usually remember this. It's natural to ask here. So we're going to have this two frequency, it looks somewhat complicated, as, you, as I'll show you, waveform here. Does it repeat? And the answer to that, you, we get the answer to that like this. So I've got this A1 going around at a constant rate at one frequency, and A2, I'm going to move it over here, it's going around like that at a different frequency. If the motion repeats, if we start here at time t is equal to zero, right? And if it repeats at some time later, the repeat time later, this is going to be precisely there and that's going to be precisely there. If it repeats, that has to be the case. There's some, you know, it's repeating. It's back to where it started from. That means that this one will have gone through an integral number of revolutions or, or cycles. And this one, this one over here will have gone through an, an integral number of cycles. But those two energies don't have to be the same, right? So we can write this simple expression here. The repeat time will be the total time for the first vector. The total time for the first vector is going to be its period, which is 2 pi over its frequency, times how many cycles it goes through to repeat, n1. 
Similarly, we can write it for, it for the second vector. It's got a different frequency, and in general, this is this you know this can be any, this can be different. This is independent of that. It's got to go through an integral number of cycles. What do you conclude from this? Well, you can cancel the two pi's. You can look at the ratio of the frequencies, and what do you find? The ratio of the frequencies is a ratio of integers. That's the definition of a rational number. So this is kind of peculiar here. The motion repeats if and only if the ratio of the frequencies is a rational number. If it's irrational, it will never repeat. I'll let you ponder that. Okay. It's, it's not such a big deal because any irrational number can be approximated to any degree you want to with a rational number. So even in situations where we have when motion doesn't repeat. You know, like in this case, these are irrational numbers. This, this ratio is an irrational number. It will look to you like it repeats. Okay? <laughs> you will be, but if you looked really carefully and you took measurements, you'd find it doesn't repeat. Pardon me? Pardon me? For normal people, it would look close enough for you to say, yeah, sure. Yeah, but you wouldn't, you know, the way our minds work is we, we tend to like order, mo most of us, I guess. You'll see it as repeating. I, I've seen this many times. And I'll say, oh, it repeats. You know, and it's not. It's not if this is the square root of 2, it's, this ratio, it's not repeating. But it'll look like it repeats. And what you're seeing there is, you know, like I said, any irrational number can be approximated with, by a rational number, as close as you want. And your mind just sees this as repeating. But if you look carefully, you'll see little deviations from one, what you think is one cycle to the next. You'll see it's not quite the same. Is that where you get the Lissajous figure? Um, yeah, Lisa's U figures are, that's, it, uh, this is related to that, yeah. That's simple harmonic motion in, in two different directions. That's what Lisa's U motion is, yeah. So it's similar to this, it's similar, yes? When it is rational and it repeats, does it repeat at the least common multiple? Or like, what's the number? Oh, when does it uh, yeah, there's gonna be, Right. There, you'll be able to calculate a minimum time that it repeats. That's the period. It'll exist. You can calculate. Now, I don't, yeah, it's, it's the, there's a minimum process there. You're right. Yeah. Uh, we always spend too much time on this. <laughs> okay. Now, so we have, uh, moving on, what happens if we have, um, we have two different frequencies and now if, I'm sorry, Josh, can you get the lights again? Okay, remember this? <laughs> okay, so now you can see that, oh, the amplitude's not the same, but there's something that's even more dramatic here. What about the frequency or a wavelength? It's exactly right. The wavelength is halved or the frequency is doubled. Right. So we're, um, so we're gonna add these two together, like we did before. I go like this, and then I, I don't know if I tested this, maybe this one will be better. Yeah, this one seems to be, oh, no, oh, God. not a good sound. Okay, so what we're looking at here is the, oh, this one's worse than the other one. Okay, I've got a, stuff is flaking, the um, plastic tubes are falling apart, so I need to push this. I need to, okay, that'll work. Okay, I gotta push hard this way to keep this thing all vertical. So now do you see, what does the waveform look like? I really can't see it. It doesn't look simple, does it? Yeah, we got two frequencies in here. And it's never really, it's never simple in this case. Well, you see what happens is, I don't, I don't know if they still make these. We have to check into this, Gene. <laughs> if they still make these, we need to get a new one. I think it's good, but you see that it was actually, a, it's a complicated looking waveform. I'm sorry, I should have pointed out, but it does repeat. Did you see it repeat? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, can't, I don't want to do this. Try this again. It, I, I should have pointed that out. If you look carefully, it does repeat because we've got, what's the ratio of the frequencies? It's, it's two, so it will repeat. No matter what the phase is, it will repeat. Okay, thanks, Josh.
And you can, cl I saw this when I was testing and I should have pointed it out to you while I was doing it. But, uh. Okay, so how do we proceed to analytically look at that, look at this? Well, the interesting case for two frequencies is when the two frequencies are close to each other. You'll see, you'll see why when we get to the end. So we're going to consider two frequencies that are close, and in these cases, in a case like this, it's natural to set one of them, the second frequency, equal to the first one plus some relatively small amount. So delta omega is sub small compared to omega one. Okay, so we're going to get rid of omega two and replace it with this. This will allow allow us to analyze this, as you'll see, right, very very soon, right here. So I do that. When I do that, now I have a common. I, and I did it without comment here. I have an e to the i omega 1 t in both terms now, once I substitute for this. So I can factor it out. All right? Here's what we're left with. Now I want you to stare at this. This is a complex number. It's got some amplitude and some phase. What are the amplitude and phase doing? Because here's the only time dependence. Oh, incidentally, that's, I can't believe I did this. You shouldn't write this like I did, because it's not real clear. Maybe that would be better, right? So the meaning here, and I'm sorry about this, this is the quantity delta omega times t. Right? You can also put a dot there to make it clear. You can put a dot. So this is the only where there's time dependence, and it's slow compared to this. So what we, the way we look at this, it's, and it's useful, is that we have a slowly varying amplitude and phase. So we have an A of T here and a phi of T, and they're slowly changing relative to this. All right, L well, let's calculate that this slowly varying function amplitude. Let's, let's calculate them. We need to take the modulus, or, or amplitude, same thing, of this. And you can do this geometrically, similarly as we did it here. Analytically, you can use the standard thing in complex analysis is to find the, the amplitude of a complex number. You multiply it by its complex conjugate and take the square root. This is elementary. I think you've all seen this, right? <laughs> okay, well, if you haven't, you, you need to look, look into that, okay? It's just, it'll just take a few minutes. <laughs> So this is one way of finding, this is the analytical way of doing it. That's what I've done here. It looks like I've used a trigonometric identity too, a cosine of a difference or sum. And we get this expression. All right. Uh, what about the phase? Well, the phase, oh, there's, huh. There's probably an analytical Well, all I can think of right now for the phase is we take, it's a, the tangent of phi is the imaginary part divided by the real part. So that's geometrical, and I guess it's also analytical. But here it is. This looks similar to before, right? I'm looking at this, and the tangent of phi is going to be the imaginary part divided by the real part. Now what do we do? Well, the answer is, you stop and think. This, the, if we carry through with the analysis here, it gets quite complicated. So we're going to look at a special case. This is the most interesting and the most dramatic case. And it's where we have equal amplitudes. This is the key thing here. This is less important, but it's convenient just to set these equal to zero. It turns out that for what we're doing here, this doesn't, this doesn't matter. But to make, to make the math easier, we're just going to um, zero these out. So if you go back to the equal amplitude and no phase, Initial, you know, initial phases being zero, and um, you know, a one equals a two equals a. You can simplify this. You can also the amplitude. You can also simplify the phase. And here's what you get. Here's what you get for the amplitude. Okay. And now it's very convenient to recognize a trigonometric identity here. That, and you've all seen this. One plus the cosine of an angle is the, um, is two times the cosine squared of a half angle. It's sometimes called a half angle formula, right? The, in acoustics, the way we like to look at this is 
looking at going this way. The square of a cosine, the square of a sinusoid is what? It's a sinusoid at twice the frequency, and it's lifted up. There's a constant there. So people tend to look at this you know, from a physical point of view. I, I look at this from a physical point of view. But it, it really is just a trigonometric identity. And this is nice because we can then take, take the square root here and we see how the amplitude varies. It varies. It's a rectified sine wave. So it's going like this. Yeah, it's going between a maximum value when this is 1, when the magnitude is, is 1, it has twice, there's constructive interference. And the destructive interference is when, um, the, co when the cosine is zero here, and we're getting, we're getting zero, perfect destructive interference. So we can, this is suggesting a physical explanation of what's going on here. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna postpone that until a little bit later, okay? So let's just continue with the mathematics right now. We found the amplitude, what about the phase? Well, if you specialize the phase on the, on the previous page, you get this. And then a little bit of analysis, which apparently at one point I thought was wrong, but then I said, no, it's right. Um, you can simplify this, it's kind of interesting, really. This simplifies down to simply, you can actually find the tan, um, take the inverse tangent. This is equivalent to simply this. It just collapses down to something very simple. So now here's what we have. We add the two. Here's our addition. No, oh, the addition gives us a slowly varying amplitude and a slowly varying phase. And it's good to go ahead and put in what that phase is. And watch what happens here. When you put in what delta omega is, it's omega 2 minus omega 1. What ends up emerging is, what's this? It's just the average frequency. Does that make sense? Yeah. Remember we have equal amplitudes here. So there's, they're weighted equally. These two sinusoids are weighted equally. It's not at all surprising that we've ended up with our fast frequency. You know, why should it be omega-1? Why can't it be omega-2? Well, it's the mean. That's what this shows, which is reasonable, I think. Our slowly varying amplitude is this. So the way we look at this, oh, incidentally, can you, if you have a hard copy, this, should, this is not envelope, it's envelope. There should be an E on the end here. It's kind of embarrassing. So if you can or, or if you care, please, this is an envelope. So we, this comes up a lot in wave analysis, signal processing. What we have here is this slowly varying amplitude. We, we call this the envelope. Okay, it's the dash line here. The question? Sorry? Question? So, uh, this absolute value here looks like this, okay? And that's going to dictate what it does down here. So usually people just draw it, just draw the cosine here. This is, and this is the, um, without the absolute value, this is the envelope. This is the care, often called the carrier. It's the faster frequency. It's the mean of the two frequencies. So what we have here in time for our two oscillators with, close, with frequencies that are close to each other, we have points where the amplitude goes down to zero. It's momentarily zero. And this is called the phenomenon of beats. And the reason I think it's called beats, this is called a beat here, is because it comes from the next demonstration that I'm going to do. Okay, So we'll postpone that for a moment. Uh, there's something else I wanted to say here. Oh, let's look. Let's ask. What if a does not? E what if a1 does not equal a2? I'm not asking you to go through the analysis, and you don't want to. Trust me. <laughs> what do you? You know what's going to happen here. Are we going to get perfect destructive interference? No, no. Yeah. So it's going to be a minimum, though. You'll still get the beating, but they won't be perfect beats. Uh, Okay, um, so any questions so far? Sorry, Josh, I hate to keep asking you to do this. We need a remote switch. <laughs> okay, so you've all seen a tuning fork, right? Tuning forks are actually uh, quite pure in frequency, but if you just have a bare tuning fork, it's a very weak radiator of sound. I, I can't 
these are bolted. I, I don't want to take these off, but if you strike just a, just a tuning fork, it's very hard to hear unless you put it close to your ear. However, what's going on here? Yep. Well, one thing is this is filthy. <laughs> okay. This is uh, closed open, okay? When the tuning fork vibrates, it's going to cause this, this top here to vibrate. This is called a soundboard in this case. It's a musical term. And the, the tuning fork has a certain frequency. The length of this box has been chosen to be one quarter of a wavelength. There's a resonance phenomenon here. Now this is getting ahead of the story because we haven't talked about waves yet. But the reason you can hear this, and it's quite loud, is because there's a resonance in here. Without that, you wouldn't be able to hear it. Uh, okay, so I've tuned these as best I can with the weight you can, this is tunable here. So this one's shorter than this, which is going to make it have a higher frequency, but then the weights make it a lower frequency. So by tuning these weights, you can get them to be approximately the same frequency. Ooh, they're a little off. Well, how do you know they're a little off? You can hear the beats. Now, it's not this. It's, it's beating like this, okay? <coughs> but, uh, and it and it's, takes a long time, so they're not quite in tune. When there are no beats, you're in tune. And this is the common way that people tune. Well, everybody now uses electronic tuners, right? So, uh, which, I don't know how they, it's probably similar inside there. But um, this is the old way you adjust tension on a string or whatever you're, however you're tuning, such that the beats go away, they become very long, then you're in tune. Okay, so now there's a little notches on here. I'm going to go to this, I'm going to move this. So I've moved this weight up. So this one's, you're not, I don't think you're going to be able to tell, but this one's going to have a lower frequency than that. And we sound them together. You can clearly hear the beats, right? Now they're not, it's not, again, I'm not giving, I'm, we're not getting the same amplitude, so it's not perfect. So what's interesting about this is, we've got, we have two oscillators here. How do we reconcile this with, with our analysis? This is a single oscillator going at two different frequencies. What's happening here is this. This is sending out a sound wave. And let's just imagine it to be a traveling wave, a nice traveling wave. Now, it's a lot more complicated than that because of reflections, but let's not worry about that. It's sending out a, um, it's sending out, let's just take it to be a nice traveling wave. Looks like this. And if you took a snapshot in some time, It's looking something like this, okay? So this is space here. We take, we take a snapshot. It's being generated here. Now the other one is also sending out sound, right? But the frequency's a little bit different, right? So let's say they start off together. If I put this one down here, I don't know if it's not gonna work, but I'm putting this one down here. It's going to be, um, in the beginning, there's approximate constructive interference. But because this frequency is different, let's say it's a lower frequency, so it's a longer wavelength, what eventually has to happen here? Let's do this engineer thing here. <laughs> so this is a, you know what this means? Okay, so this, this is a, a break here. What eventually has to happen is what? This is cons pure constructive interference. And eventually, because these wavelengths are a little bit different, eventually they're going to be out of phase. It'll look like this. There'll be, um, one will be here, like this, and the other one will be they'll be out of phase, like this. That's the beat. And then it goes on. What's going to happen next? It takes a certain amount of time to go here. If I go the same time over here, what's going to happen? We're going to be back to constructive interference. So this is the physical explanation, which 
yeah, it's, it's obvious, right? I guess what's not so obvious is we had to go through all this math, to, look at this, to just to, to math quantitatively describe this a phenomenon that's actually quite simple. Okay, um, that's okay, Josh. Let me get it. All right, are there any? I'll give you a break. <laughs> So any questions or comments? Uh, all right. Now I want to point out something here. And I've never seen this stated. This is, it's in books. It's a very common topic. Mechanics books and acoustics books. We took the frequencies to be close, right? We're imagining the free delta omega to be relatively small. Where did we make that approximation in, the, in our derivation? I'll let you look through this if you're interested. Starting from here. Where did we actually explicitly assume that delta omega was much less than omega 1? We didn't anywhere. This is true exactly. <laughs> this is actually true exactly. This is a way of representing the field. And the reason it's not all that useful is the beat period now is comparable. If, if we take a um, substantial difference between the frequencies, it's not going to have this nice, slow, you know, beating pattern. The beats are, can be roughly the period of the wave. And it just, you get a complicated type waveform because you've got two frequencies. And they're there, but you have to look hard to see them. And it happen, happens quickly. This is nice and slow, as you heard there. Uh, okay, so any questions? Okay, so the f along the line of superposing frequencies, we're now going to talk about um, adding together an infinite number of frequencies, but not just any frequencies. We're going to consider um, adding frequencies that are harmonic. So the frequencies, and I'll explain why in a moment, we're going to have some fundamental frequency. That's what, the, that's what acousticians, they have, a, they call, they use the word fundamental here. That's an important name because it specifies it's, it's the lowest frequency. So that's going to be omega. And we're going to imagine now harmonics. And harmonics just mean, you know, integer multiplications, etc. So these are called, this is the second harmonic. These are called harmonics in general. And the reason we're considering this is, if you look at, let's look at a complex waveform here. Now you'll notice that I drew this, actually I drew this pretty well, didn't I? <laughs> it, look, it repeats, right? Can everyone see that? If you look at the peak here, from here to here it's repeating, from there to there it's repeating. You see the waveform repeats. It turns out that by superposing these frequencies, and in general it takes an infinite number, we can exactly reproduce that waveform. And this is extremely useful. We have um, equipment that does this, they're called signal analyzers, and you'll be doing this in the lab eventually. I don't know when, I can't remember, but you're, uh, eventually you'll be doing this. So I look at a time series here, and this can look quite complicated, and I can, what can I get out of this? Well, I see that it repeats, but I, how do I get more information about it? Well, the answer is these components, and these are called Fourier components, and here's the, here's the mathematical statement, it's called Fourier's theorem, that any signal that repeats, and, it, and it's, they're very weak assumptions here, I can't, I mean, it's been decades since I looked at this rigorously, but just about any waveform you're going to en encounter, any actual waveform, this is going to work. You're go and let's focus on this form. These are equivalent forms. We've seen this before, right? Remember this? Um, treating a cosine and a, and a sine wave with, with different amplitudes is, is the same as, because these are the, at each end, the same frequency, we can, just, we can just deal with a single sinusoid with an amplitude and a phase. So these are alternative waves. We talked about this earlier chapter. 
right now it's convenient to look here. So Fourier's theorem tells us that if you've got just about any repeating signal, and it doesn't even have to be continuous, as you'll see shortly. We'll do an example. So it can make jumps. It can be a square wave. So this is very general here. There'll, there will exist coefficients here, a and b, okay? And there's a DC term here. You know, this whole, this waveform here could be lifted up, right? Its average value is not necessarily zero, and that happens. So that's why we need the constant here, the zero frequency term. So there exist, and it's better to look over here, there exist coefficients here at each of, all, each of the harmonics and phases such that you can reproduce that signal. So in general, what people do is they'll eventually truncate this. It'll become, typically they'll fall off and become much smaller. And um, well, eventually they have to or the series wouldn't exist. So they just, you, you, you eventually truncate it. You can approximate the signal. And the advantage of this is, is that we now have a different perspective on the signal. Instead of looking at the time series here that we really can't get that much directly from, we can now talk about these Fourier components, particularly these amplitudes. Usually people don't care about the phases in this case. What um, signal analyzers will give you both of these, but usually we focus on the amplitudes. And that's useful information. That's useful information. Now, there's a problem. We, we were given this. We're given the f of t, right? How do we find, now we're going to switch over here. It's convenient. To, instead of c and phi, let's go to a and b. It's equivalent. How do we find a and b? How many of you remember how to do this? Didn't you have, did you have a course recently? 3991, maybe? Do you all take 3991? Oh, no, we got USW students, don't do they? Right. Just PEs. And the distance learning student has probably been Geometric a long time. Well, that's an example of a series, yeah. Um, okay, so this is called a Fourier series, right? And you can see that we immediately have a problem, an analytical problem. The way equipment, uh, the equipment uses this um, um, algorithm called the fast Fourier transform, FFT. Have you heard of that? Yeah, okay, I'm sure that all the distance learning students, well, I don't know, they probably have too, okay? That actually allows you to see these amplitudes and phases real time with, with the analyzer. These analyzers aren't all that cheap, okay? But it allows you to, uh, to actually see that, that's nice. But how do we do it analytically? That's the question that we have right now. How do we determine these A's and B's given an F? They're buried in this sum here. Multiply both sides by a sine function. Right. Like but let's back up here a little bit for the people who don't know about this. <laughs> okay. If I have two vectors, how do I know if they're perpendicular or not? Dot product. I take the dot product. If they're perpendicular, what's the dot product? Zero. It's zero, right? They're perpendicular. Believe it or not, it's hard to see it, but that's that goes that's happening here. But because it's not the same as actual vector, we, use, we have to use a different word, so we call it orthogonality. So here's the idea. Take any cosine wave and any sine wave. That's our vector now. I want you to kind of think of it abstractly as a vector. And the inner product here is you at each time you multiply them together and add them all up. That's an inner product, right? Ax, Bx plus Ay, By, except it's an infinite inner. This is actually like an inner product. You may have never thought of it that way before, and maybe no one ever told you. But this is really a kind of inner product here. And it turns out any cosine and any sine, they're, don't say perpendicular, right? Because that's a geometrical thing. We, they're orthogonal. It's zero. So in a sense, they are perpendicular to each other, and we, and we use the word orth orthogonal. Now, to explain why this is useful in a moment here, um, what about... Um, a cosine and a cosine. Well, it turns out if you have different frequencies here, so on, on the average, this is zero. That's what this is telling us. When you integrate something like this and it's, and it's zero, you can put them one over t here. We're, f we're finding the average. The average value is zero. It turns out with cosine at different frequencies, the average value is zero, which I think is plausible. And this is plausible too, that this is zero. You can prove it with a trigonometric identity, but it's plausible that this is going to, half the time it's going to be positive, half the time it's going to be negative, or, and it'll have zero crossings. But on the average, it's going to be zero. This is also going to be zero. 
except when n is equal to m. What's the average, and then it's going to be just the square of a cosine, and everyone knows the average of the square of a cosine or a sine? Oh. Sometimes you just want to quit teaching. One half, right. Remember that? Can you see it in the notes or in your heads? So the average, this cosine squared is going between 0 and 1. The average is 1 half. Same way with the sine. Phase is not, doesn't matter. So that's why we use the chronic or delta here. When m equals m, we're going to get 1 half. Okay, so now we get to what Jim or James. Do you go by Jim? James. I've never heard anyone call you Jim before. It sounds weird. That's, That's why. Weird. I, yeah, okay, it is, it is weird. It sounds weird. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Ooh. <laughs> Freaky. <laughs> this doesn't sound right. <laughs> it's like calling you a different name, you know, and it's kind of weird. Like Frank or something, you know. It's weird. Okay. <laughs> Um, so how do we utilize this? Well, we've got to, these are buried in here. We can multiply each side of the equation by, let's say, the cosine of m omega t, where m is any integer. We can choose it. m omega t. So I multiply here and here, and then what do I do? I integrate. What effect is that going to have? It's going to pick out, yeah, go ahead. Oh, it's going to get rid of all except for? Uh, except for one. It's going to pick out the, if I multiply by the cosine, all of these are going to go. It's going to pick out a particular value of m. That's the whole key here to Fourier analysis. It's actually pretty simple once you, once you see it. So here are the formulas, standard formulas. What I just described to you, and now I've replaced m with n, this is common to do. I can find the nth component just by multiplying by cosine of n omega t and doing this integral over one of the fundamental period here, t. And similarly, I can find the sine coefficient. Uh, ignore this. I'm, I'm going to delete that when I eventually type the notes. Just kill that. And we already talked a little bit about that. Okay, so that's the idea. How many people remember seeing this before? I know all the combat system students have, right? Because you guys take 3991. But we have USW students in here, right? Just take uh, partial differential equations between But did you do Fourier analysis? Yeah. Oh, okay. Good. Yeah, just because you do partial PDEs doesn't mean. But, you know, this is kind of a separate topic. Okay, that's good. Yeah, this is really useful. This gives us a different picture on a waveform. The time series can be really complicated. But we know the Fourier components, we feel more comfortable. Okay? Now, I can see that I screwed up. I forgot to do this. Sorry. So let's do that. Josh, you don't have to. Oh. Yeah, in fact, it's probably better because I'm going to show the, uh, the oscilloscope here. Incidentally, a lot of oscilloscopes these days have FFT analyzers in them. It's just they're not all that easy to use. And signal analyzers also have, you can operate it like an oscilloscope, but it's not all that easy. So usually in the lab, what I've always done, and I think a lot of other people too, is we, we have both an oscilloscope and a signal analyzer. And that's what's going to happen in the acoustics labs when we get into this. You'll see both. It's just very convenient to have two. If you, know, you got the money, right? Okay. So here's a an organ pipe, right? And that's a tone, you hear a tone, right? And I'm generating it by blowing it across here. And incidentally, this process was not understood until the 1970s. This is complicated. A steady flow of air ex maintaining these oscillations. Remember we've talked about that before? Maintained oscillator, it's, it's complicated. It was finally, apparently, they say, they tell us it's, I tried to read into it, you know, get some understanding. It's, comp it's really complicated. But, but apparently it was finally understood how this thing worked. And this goes back, you know, how many tens of thousands of years do you think flutes and stuff go? It, it's, I think they've got it back to 40,000 years now. They found flutes, you know, some kind of, tr uh, never mind. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, here's a microphone. 
I'm using a preamp here just to clean up the signal a little bit and amplify it. And let's see what the waveform looks like. Oh, perfect sinusoid, right? No, it's, it's far from it, right? Far from it. And how is that happening? Why is it a nice sinusoid? Hmm? You have two overheads. Well, um, I don't know. That's part. Of, that's getting there. I think I, it's the excitation mechanism here. We're not driving this with a pure frequency. If we drove it with a pure frequency, we'd get a pure frequency out. But there are many systems, particularly musical instruments, where you don't drive with a pure. You know, you're you're blowing or you're bo you're drawing a string, a bow across a string. How does that work? We talked about that. Okay, that wasn't understood until 1920s, where they finally were able, able to get high-speed photographs. It was suspected, but not really proved. And a physicist actually did it. Uh, an, an Indian physicist, I can't remember his name right now. What's happening here is the string is continually sticking and slipping, sticking and slipping. And it's resonating. You know, the string has a, it's going to have a resonant frequency. And it's this continual slip stick that's causing that. Okay, that's, is that a harmonic drive? Is that a drive at a definite? No, it's kind of an abrupt kind of thing. So you're, you're going to excite other modes of the string besides just the fundamental. Okay, I need to push a button here. Uh, okay, so I wanted to show this earlier and I forgot as an example of a complicated waveform. So it'll, have, it'll possess some Fourier series. What we want to do right now is an example of a square wave. So here's a square wave. We'll take its value, just normalize it to one here. There's the period, T, right, of the square wave. Everyone's seen this before, square wave. Um, it's periodic. It will possess a Fourier transform. And here's how we find the coefficient of the cosine terms. All right, and here's how we find the coefficient of the sine terms. Let's look at the sine. Let's look at the sine of omega t first. Do you think that's going to appear in our Fourier series? Oh yeah, that's a rough approximation to a score. Wave. No one ever thinks of it that way, but if you think just really roughly, this is a rough approximation. So that Fourier component is not going to be zero. What about the cosine of omega t? Well, the cosine of omega t looks like this, right? It's helping us here. What's it doing down here? It's equally hurting us. It's on the right. It's got a minus sign. So, how do you think the cosine of omega t is? What do you think the Fourier coefficient is going to be of cosine? It's zero. And the math will. T you don't have to worry about this if you don't want to think. The math will tell you. But it's always good to get a physical, especially in acoustics, because we can get physical a physical feeling for a lot of phenomena in acoustics. So. Um, all right, uh, let's, oh, what about the sine of 2 omega t? What does that look like? So here's the sine, right, omega t. The sine of 2 omega t is going to come like this, come down like that, and go like that. It's going to repeat after half of the fundamental cycle. Is that going to help us? No. No. And the analysis will tell you that. Down here it tells you that. Okay, so, um, I'll, we'll, do, we'll do a problem, at least one problem on this on Monday. But I'll tell you right now, if you take this, if you take this, no matter whether little n here is even or odd, it's not going to matter. You're going to find that there's zero. The math tells you there's zero. And it's really, a, what I've tried to show you is it's a symmetry issue here. We really don't have to calculate this, but you know, people do just because you want to be sure, right? So um, you can do this. Similarly, you can show that for the even harmonics, the sine of 2 omega t, 4 omega t, etc., this has vanished. Oh, that's going to actually come out of the analysis. I'm sorry. So let's quickly look at this here. And like, like I said, we'll s more slowly go through an example on Monday. Um, so we don't need to assume this here. Here's what the formula tells us. Now, what's our f of t? It's actually really easy. It just toggles between 1 and minus 1. So it's 1 over half a period and minus 1. It's 1 over half a period. And over the other half a period, it's minus 1. 
So now I've got, we can all do these integrals. And here's the result. Uh, they both contribute the same, it turns out. This integral is, is negative, is, is the opposite of this, so that two minus signs cancel and you get a doubling, which is expected by the symmetry here. And this is just standard integral calculus here. And in the end, look at this, it's kind of interesting here. You get the cosine of n pi, which is minus one to the n, if you think about it. And now, if n is even, what happens here? Can you see it? If n is even, zero. Let's just prove this, what we, that it's zero. We just proved it, okay? And we know it's true by symmetry. And we get, the, here are, are the Fourier coefficients. They fall off, they really have to fall off or the series is not gonna converge. Um, they fall off, but they don't fall off very strongly. And that has an interesting consequence. So this is from the book. Here's our square wave, one minus one. It's over, um, this is one period of the square wave. Here's the, the fundamental Fourier component, the sine. You notice how it has a bigger amplitude than one, right? Which makes sense because this is a crude approximation to this. So we want to, to make up for over here, we want to make that go bigger. It's not surprising, it's doing that. This is the fundamental. This is the fundamental plus the third harmonic. There is no second harmonic. If there were a second harmonic, there would be an asymmetry, an up-down asymmetry here. And that's not going to happen for this F. This F has is kind of an anti-symmetry or whatever, some kind of symmetry between up and positive and negative. So here's the first plus the third. It's doing a little better. Here's the first, the third, and the fifth. Okay. And then it just kind of, as, as you go along here, it just, it's like a, we, we're painfully waiting for this thing to converge, right? So how many terms does it take to converge? It's not a trick question. It really takes an infinite number. What's interesting here is that it's not really after, I don't know what number of harmonic this is. This is way out there. Uh, you can count them up if you want to. But it's still not doing very well, right? But eventually, you know, you can take it out to where you, you'll, you will eventually be satisfied and you'll say, okay, that's it, we're, cut, we're cutting it off here. It'll be an approximation. So why is it so slowly converging? Well, I put one reason here. One over n, t a sequence that, that goes like one over n, summations, slowly <coughs> converges. In fact, if you just, do you know what the sum of, if you just have one over n, which we don't have here. Anybody know what this is equal to? Yes, it's, it doesn't converge. It, it diverges. This is like integrating, it's like a logarithm. It's like the integral of 1 over x. That's a, you can think of it that way. That's a, you know, integral of 1 over x is a logarithm, and a logarithm evaluated at infinity diverges. So we have other things here that make it converge. So, but this is weak convergence. So that's one reason, but I didn't write down another reason. There's another obvious reason here that I should have written down. Why is this taking so long? What are we asking this to do? We're asking this to fit a discontinuous function here. You know there's gonna be trouble with a discontinuous function. We have all these continuous functions here, nice, infinitely smooth. The sines and cosines you can differentiate forever. They're infinitely smooth. And we're reproducing a discontinuous function. You would expect to have trouble. You would expect to, you know, to not be able to fit this well. Because we have these jumps here. But it's, it's getting there, you know, it's getting there. Just have to, you know, take as many as what you, what you feel comfortable with, what, whatever purposes you have, you know. You can, you can approximate it any, to any degree you want to. You just have to go higher and higher if you want to get a better approximation. Okay, sorry we went over again. Anybody have any quick questions or comments? So there's a lab tomorrow. Um, okay.